Hello and welcome everyone to HI. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, on a somewhat rainy day. Um, welcome to the HI Research Seminar. I'm Caroline Meinhardt. I'm the Policy Research Manager here at HI. And I am thrilled to introduce you to our speaker today, Michelle Mello. Michelle is a professor of law at Stanford Law School and also a professor of health policy at the Stanford School of Medicine. She conducts empirical research into issues at the intersection of law, ethics, and health policy. She's the author of more than 250 articles on medical liability, public health law, pharmaceuticals and vaccines, and ethical and legal issues pertaining to biomedical research, data use, and AI, among other topics. In today's seminar, Michelle will discuss the question of responsibility when healthcare AI tools harm patients. This session will examine how courts are grappling with the challenges of adjudicating liability for software-related injuries and how health systems and clinicians can assess and manage AI liability risk. So a lot of very nitty gritty topics to dive into. Um, before we begin the presentation, I do have a few logistics um, to talk through. For our Zoom audience, you can use the Zoom chat to message the group, but ask, um, but please do ask questions through Slido. You can click on the link that will be uh, put in the chat shortly. I'll be choosing questions from the Slido after the presentation during the Q&A session. And Slido also has a nice upvote feature. So um, you can choose the questions that all of you are most interested in. So do make sure you get your questions in and you vote for your favorite questions. And then when it comes to the Q&A, we'll split the time between questions from our audience here live in the room and our virtual audience. So without further ado, um, let's begin. Welcome, Michelle Miller. Uh, finally got around to watching Oppenheimer over the last three days. That's how long it takes to get through that movie. Uh, and was just reminded how common it actually is for technologists who are developing breakthrough technologies to focus on the task so intensely that they forget to think about the risk. Uh, and they need others to come in and remind them that as part of the development process, there needs to be thoughtful attention to not eliminating, but managing uh, risk. And that's what makes me so proud to be a lawyer, because that is what we do uh, and, and maybe overdue at many uh, points in time. And that's what I really want to focus on today in the context of breakthrough tools in the artificial intelligence realm as they relate to healthcare. Um, this is joint work uh, with Neil Guha, who's here with us today. Um, Neil is about to uh, become a lawyer, a graduate of Stanford Law School. He's also a trainee in the PhD program here in computer science and a high graduate fellow and has um, been extraordinarily helpful in helping me understand the connections between the technology here and the law. Uh, we published our work recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, I think last week. Uh, and it was a, a research project funded by HI, for which we're very uh, grateful. And we want to offer these um, financial disclosures around our own consulting relationships. Uh, for anyone who'd like to, to see the paper, apparently it's not available full text online. But if you shoot me an email, I'd be more than happy to share the full text of the article. So what I'll try to cover today is uh, why we should care about liability risk around healthcare AI. Why does it matter in the big scheme of things to anybody other than lawyers and risk managers? And secondly, how I think we think healthcare organizations and physicians ought to be thinking about uh, the amount of uncertainty around liability in this realm at this particular point in time. So as I said, lawyers are very good at warning and overwarning, and there are no shortage of professional education programs right now for healthcare AI that really focus on the tremendous potential liability risk around use of this technology. Um, so here's a graphic from one presentation, a quote from another. Uh, and again, reminding me of Oppenheimer, this sort of envisions healthcare artificial intelligence innovation as the fission process that will set off an uncontrolled chain reaction leading to this mushroom cloud of legal ramifications. 
from lawsuits to debarment from federal programs. Um, it's not surprising that when they receive advice like this and are told that this could be a potential disaster for them, that healthcare organizations, physicians and nurses, and even startup companies might have second thoughts about getting into this space. That matters because we desperately need this technology in many areas of healthcare. And although we are rightly concerned about safety risks, often forgotten is that the field of health policy has been obsessed with safety risks in healthcare for the last 30 years and unsettled about, about the amount of progress that we've actually made in addressing some risks to patient safety. And AI really offers a lot of promise for getting at some of the endemic problems in old fashioned healthcare that lead patients to get hurt. Especially important is making further progress on diagnostic errors. Physicians continue to miss or delay diagnosis at very high rates, and it causes enormous suffering. It also leads to an enormous amount of expensive litigation. So the idea that these promising technologies might be chilled in their development and their adoption because people are worried about being sued, I think belies the amount of legal risk and real risk to patients that's already there. And that would be a shame if there's a promising technology that doesn't get disseminated because of that. This liability risk also matters to AI developers because they have to raise money. And uncertainty about downside risk is going to affect the cost of capital. It's going to affect the incentives that they have and that their investors have to put their energy into particular kinds of products, according to the amount of risk and benefit that they would perceive in those areas. So ultimately, this liability risk then has the prospect of affecting the kinds of AI innovations that reach the public and the price that those innovations have attached to them, and therefore who can afford to adopt them and benefit from them. So this, to me, is far more than a lawyer's concern. And to be clear, I do think there are some real reasons why we should be concerned here. When Neil and I sort of thought about this area of liability, there are a lot of red flags that come to mind here. Um, and first and foremost is that relative to other kinds of innovations that are adopted in healthcare organizations, there's not a great deal of testing that goes on before some forms of AI tools are rolled out. We rely, moreover, disproportionately on private companies, the developers of these tools, to do that testing. And that's different from, for example, drugs or medical devices where we have large clinical trials run with at least a fair degree of transparency and reporting to the government. So a lot of the testing is done where we can't see it very clearly. And there's just less. There's less that has to be done to satisfy regulators. And because everybody's racing to be first here in terms of both innovation and adoption, there's just less that goes on by private initiative. And that has a lot of physicians and nurses worried that the, the rush to be first, the speed with which this is uh, moving from innovation to dissemination poses real risks to patients. And again, these are folks who are already aware that there's a lot of risk in healthcare just under the watchful eye of, of humans. So these are not naive to the counterfactual here. And nevertheless, the relative lack of testing in this area is of concern to them. Second, our observation has been that when an area doesn't get a lot of formal regulation from the government, tort liability, personal injury litigation, comes in to fill the gaps. And we see this over and over historically with the rise of mass production and injury, for example, due to products, there emerged a whole new doctrine around product liability. Eventually, federal regulators realized the need to come and do more direct regulation of products, both medical products and other products. But until that happens, the lawyers will fill the gaps and the courts will let them. They will evolve new doctrines to fill in and provide remedies to people who are injured. And that's, of course, the state that we're in right now with AI. Lots of interest in increasing regulation, but as yet little activity, the courts will serve as the backstop. There are other concerns around the nature of injuries that occur from AI. One problem is that if there's a systemic problem with a model, it's likely to propagate over many patients. So we're talking about lots of injuries, lots of costs. Another problem is that the public largely has distrust of AI's use in healthcare. A recent poll found that six in 10 Americans said that they personally would be uncomfortable with AI being used in their healthcare. And why does that matter? It matters because it affects the priors that every juror is seated with. 
about the company that's on trial. And it matters because when something goes wrong in healthcare, patients and their families want answers. And often, particularly when there's not a lot of information forthcoming from the physician or the hospital, they fill in the blanks with their own suppositions. And in this case, their supposition might well be, I just learned that something that involves AI was used in my care, I had no idea. Something went wrong, therefore it must have been due to the AI. These kinds of harm events are very likely to be reported in the newspaper, they're sexy, they're interesting. So this kind, this kind of a problem involves reputational harm for institutions as well as lawsuits. And then there's the problem of where all these lawsuits go. So I've talked about jurors, but it's judges who are mainly gonna be adjudicating these cases in the early stages, deciding whether they go forward. And as I'm gonna talk about, when Neil and I looked at cases where judges were trying to do this for software related injuries, we found really a profound lack of sophistication around these technologies, the difference between AI and other kinds of software. And that's not awesome if you're a defendant trying to defend your conduct in court to have an adjudicator who you feel fundamentally doesn't understand the technology that you used. Finally, because this area of doctrine is so immature, it's very unclear how courts will go about allocating liability among several people who might have been involved in some way in a patient's injury. Should liability be placed on the product developer, on the hospital that purchased this technology and implemented it and decided how it was gonna be used in workflow, on the physician or nurse who actually used it, or on the patient who might themselves have made some decision that affected the outcome in, the, in their care. Doctrine has a lot to do with how al al uh, this allocation of liability gets done and it's really underdeveloped. So lots of reasons to be legitimately concerned here. I think there's also some reasons for reassurance. And, and this sort of draws on 20 plus years of my other work on medical errors and malpractice liabilities, things that we've learned generally about how this area of law works. And the number one thing that we have learned is almost nobody sues. About 2% of the injuries due to medical negligence in this country ever become lawsuits. They're overwhelmingly cases of serious injury. And doctors radically overestimate the risk of being sued if they injure a patient through their own negligence. So right off the bat, we're really just talking about the tip of the iceberg in terms of which of these injuries actually become claims. Other reasons to be reassured, I think, is that when Neil and I looked for evidence of a lot of litigation going on, we really didn't find it, at least not yet. And finally, as I wanna talk about plaintiffs in these cases, the people bringing the lawsuits have some really significant barriers to overcome in proving their case. Now, in our liability system, it's the plaintiff's burden to prove several elements of a claim when they're trying to get redress for a personal injury. And many of these elements pose real challenges for plaintiffs when we're talking about software in general and artificial intelligence models in particular. For example, one thing the plaintiff has to show is that the defendant had a duty to them. This isn't ordinarily a problem for software cases. Um, however, there are certain kinds of AI that because they're embedded in a medical device could be subject to a legal doctrine called preemption, which basically says, because there's a federal statute that kind of regulates in this area, we don't let people bring tort claims in state court for injuries that arise from these products. The problem is at this, clear, at this juncture, it's kind of unclear which devices this doctrine will apply to, but it's a problem for plaintiffs. A second problem relates to proving that the defendant fell below the standard of care. And this is a really sticky one because our law applies different standards of care for product manufacturers versus clinicians who might have harmed a patient in the course of care. So we want to know which bucket these uh, claims ought to fall in. And one thing that we learn uh, from looking at other cases involving software liability is courts are really not sure yet whether software is even a product. Historically, they've been unwilling to recognize it as such. And that makes it obviously much harder to hold product makers liable for outcomes of those algorithms in product liability. Um, but there are other problems as well. AI models, of course, are really opaque. We don't often know exactly how or why they produced a particular result. They're essentially encoding statistical patterns based on maybe millions of different parameters. Um, yet the plaintiff has to be able to come forward and say, uh, look, first of all, this output made the model defective. 
And secondly, it was unreasonable for the doctor to have relied on this output. Well, if we can't explain why the model reached the results it did, how do we accuse a physician of being unreasonable in having followed that output? It's not easy. The injury to the plaintiff also has to have been foreseeable by the physician or the manufacturer. And again, if we can't show exactly what it was about this algorithm that produced a result for this particular patient, how can we prove that the physician should have known? Yes, there may be arguments plaintiffs can make about, well, the training data looked really different than this patient, for example. But it's going to be very difficult for plaintiffs to produce the level of evidence and the specificity of evidence that courts are going to want to see in order, for example, to find a physician negligent or to say that this piece of software was defective. Because one thing that we clearly found in our review is that it's not enough just to say, look, this software produced the wrong result, therefore there's a defect in it that we can hold the product maker liable for. No, courts want to know what exactly about the software was defective. And again, that may be very difficult to prove, especially in areas where this is a new product, there's not a lot of competitors on the market that we could compare to. And especially where the algorithm actually outperforms humans. To go to court and now say, something that does better than human doctors actually should be considered defective, and the doctor should have been considered unreasonable for relying on it, that's tough, because traditionally in medical malpractice law, we evaluate the doctor's conduct by reference to what other skilled doctors in that area would have done. Here's an algorithm that does better than those doctors. It just happens that in this case, it didn't. These are really tricky problems of proof. And finally, plaintiffs have to show that the defect in the product was causally connected to the bad thing that happened to them. That too can be very difficult, especially when Again, we remember that the defect has to be a specific part of the algorithm or the training data that they can point to as wrong. Connecting that back to the ultimate clinical outcome may be pretty tough. So all of these things mean that it's actually going to be quite a tough road for plaintiffs, I think. Much harder than a garden variety malpractice claim, which is already pretty hard to win, actually. But one thing that we can say with confidence, I think, is that when there evolves a situation where injured people are systematically having problem finding redress in the tort system, and people start to care about that problem in society, courts respond. They change the doctrine, usually in the direction of making it friendlier for people who are trying to, to obtain this kind of legal redress. And we very much expect that this kind of awkward adolescence in liability doctrine is not going to hold. Judges are going to start adopting rules that kind of patch some of these bugs in the way the legal system will treat software cases and patch them in ways that, that help plaintiffs. So we need to be thinking about how to manage risk. Even if there's not a lot of it right now, I think that's not likely to be the case for long. So Neil and I were interested in whether any of that sort of patching or evolution in the doctrine was visible yet. Neil screened over 800 cases of personal injuries that involved uh, software of some kind, usually not AI, but sometimes, and found that there are just about 50 cases that were germane to the kinds of questions that we were asking. And what we found was some limited signal about how judges are dealing with these cases. We found that right now, cases involving software injuries tend to cluster in three kind of fact patterns or situations. One is situations where some piece of software is used for care management or direct care provision. Um, so for example, on the, the top row here, you, we, we see patients who are suing the developers of software as well as hospitals that have implemented this software, um, alleging things uh, like, for example, this um, user interface in an electronic health record system was so defective that it led providers to think they'd given meds when they hadn't. A second category of case, uh, represented in the second row here, is um, when the, a, pr a predictive algorithm has been used to guide treatment decisions. So for example, uh, there's a case involving a young man who, according to several lab tests that, was fed, that were fed into an algorithm, was at a very low risk of having a cardiac event. But the algorithm didn't apparently account for the fact that he had a family history of sudden cardiac death. That's a pretty big glitch. Uh, and this young man, six weeks later, after being screened and not given any follow-up for um, cardiac screening, died of a congenital heart defect. 
Um, that's the kind of case where the physician and the hospital are going to be on trial for negligently relying on a faulty predictive algorithm. And then in the third category here, we have a group of cases that involve software being embedded in physical medical devices, like implantables or wearables. And in these cases, um, there's just a, a failure of the software that causes the device itself to malfunction, sometimes with tragic results, as in this example of a, an infusion pump that delivered a, a lethal dose of morphine. Um, and in those cases, the developer is going to be on the hook, so is the physician, so is the hospital. So these are the kinds of fact patterns that we think pose the greatest risk of popping up in litigation. And as we looked at how courts handled these claims, there were a few sort of takeaways. Um, one is that there is evidence of our sort of supposition that the opacity of these models and their complexity makes it hard for plaintiffs. A lot of these cases we found getting thrown out at relatively early stages because the plaintiff had not been, been able to plead with enough specificity exactly what was wrong with the algorithm. A second thing we found is that Often these are algorithms that performed well on average and just didn't for a particular patient or subgroup of patients. And so that raises really hard questions about what it means to be a reasonable physician using that algorithm. Should you know that it's likely to underperform for this patient? When should a jury conclude that much? And then finally, as I alluded to before, we found evidence that courts tend to use kind of blanket terms when talking about these technologies. It's all software to them. They don't appreciate distinctions between ML-based models and other kinds of software, even though they introduce important differences like opacity that might call for a different set of rules. For example, let's, be, let's help plaintiffs out more with AI because we know they can't look under the hood as much. Different set of rules for AI or software, no. It's all kind of one uh, set of adjudications and um, that's not great. Again, if we think about courts trying to evolve doctrine to help plaintiffs in this area, we'd prefer that they were a little bit more surgical, so to speak, about how they do that. I, I don't see any evidence of that happening. So this, I think, is kind of the state of play right now. There's litigation. There's not a ton. When we look at what's going on, there are some pretty consistent fact patterns that seem to convey risk. And when we look at how judges are dealing with them, they're often shutting plaintiffs down but these cases are raising really important conundrums that are likely, we think, ultimately to be resolved in plaintiff's favor. So in that environment, how should we think about managing risk? Because again, we don't, managing risk shouldn't take the form of we're not going to use AI, in my opinion. That cost is simply too great in terms of patient benefit, in terms of preventing provider burnout, et cetera. So what we really try to be thoughtful about is how do you do a fine-grained risk assessment that takes advantage of what we've learned about where risk seems to lie so far. So let me talk about a few recommendations. Um, but first, let me just introduce this sort of way of thinking about AI liability risk. So we think that any kind of risk assessment here should start with where it usually starts, where the conversation usually is about AI safety and responsibility, and that is, the question of how likely it is that this model output is going to be wrong and how wrong. How, how should we think about the, the likelihood of error and the severity of the error itself? As part of this, I think something we don't talk about quite as much is how should we think about the risk that clinicians will do the wrong thing in response to model output? Either fail to go along with output that's actually correct. For example, we know that people who have a distrust of computer decision support are much less likely to rely on it, to use it? Um, or how likely they are, are they to rely on output that's actually wrong? For example, lots of research in human-computer interaction tells us that people tend to over-rely on computer decision supports, not to notice errors that are there, or to dismiss errors that run counter to their own intuition. And then finally, we really have to think about how the model is integrated into workflow, meaning you're in the hospital, you're a doctor, you're, you're going about your day. Where, does, where do you encounter this technology and how? Because how that is designed can have an important effect on how much attention clinicians are paying to the fact that there is a model working in the background, 
what incentives they have to spend time worrying about whether the output is correct, and even the amount of information that they have to enable them to assess whether this output might be incorrect. So all of this, I think, is fairly intuitive, and it, it's where I think at least some of the conversation is right now. But I think there are other layers. You know, again, when we look at other um, areas of systems engineering, and even the field of patient safety more generally over the last 30 years, uh, there is just recognition that we have to think not just about how, in, how, you know, how likely errors are to arise, but how likely is it that we can catch them before they hurt somebody? And this is an, uh, an area that's especially important to physicians because what we've learned in patient safety is so much of what goes wrong is actually about the interaction of human error and broader systems or environments of care. And patients get hurt when there are failures like just down the line that overlap. It's a sort of Swiss cheese model of human error that says only the things that reach the patient are things that happen when there's a cascade of failures. The problem is in the legal system, physicians almost always get blamed for the outcome. It's very hard to hold systems accountable. So physicians can be and, and should be probably really concerned about the fact that they're kind of going to be the liability sink, the sponge that absorbs liability for things that maybe could have been caught by systems. So part of risk management should be, how do I interpose layers of systems, other human overseers, other automated overseers, that will arrest error before it reaches the patient? So one thing that matters a lot is how tightly coupled is the technology with what happens to the patient? You know, is, is there a human in the loop or does it take action automatically like that morphine pump? Another thing that matters is the amount of time that's involved for a human to take a look, do outside research, consultation, et cetera, make an informed decision about whether to rely on the output. And a third thing is, that matters is something we call situational opportunity, again, from other areas of human factors engineering, the notion that um, even when time permits, there are conditions that enhance or depress the likelihood that a human is going to catch and intervene in response to a technology error. And in this context, what comes to mind for me is things like, how busy is this physician? Is it the kind of task they would ordinarily be inclined to spend time on or not? Is it the kind of task that they're incentivized to spend time on or not? There are lots of other things as well, but you get the idea. We're looking at the broader systems in which these technologies are embedded and asking, how can we catch errors before they harm patients? And it's the ones we can't catch that ought to be of greatest concern. And that's especially going to be the case when we get to this third step and think about the, the severity of the harm. And this is really where the FDA, for example, is currently focusing its oversight of software embedded in medical devices. It's really concerned about things that have high potential to cause harm, either because they're doing things that are super important clinically, like directly delivering medication, or because they're dealing with patients who are fragile and inclined to be very hurt when something goes wrong in their care. But now I have to bring the lawyers back in because all this comes from engineering. But what lawyers will tell you is, um, it, if you're asking me about risk management, this all makes sense. If you're asking me about legal risk management, I have more to say. Because again, most people are never going to sue you. Even if all of these things are present, even if it's unlikely that they are going to find redress in the legal system. And organizations may want to take that into consideration as well. So who is likely to find redress? Again, overwhelmingly, it's people with serious or fatal injuries. When we look at other kinds of medical malpractice claims, 85% of people who file claims have a permanent disabling injury or fatal injury. It's people who make attractive clients and witnesses for a variety of reasons. It's people who have high incomes, who have large damages because plaintiff's attorneys get paid based on a share of the award. They would prefer to see larger damages. And it's people who you can make the claim fairly straightforwardly for. Is there a tight causal connection between what happened and what hurt them, or was it part of a long causal chain? Is the glitch in the model readily apparent, or do we just know that something went wrong and a model was used? And this is, you know, this is where things start to get a little messed up in terms of how we think about risk management, because the models that are actually the most unsafe 
might not be the models that pose the greatest medical legal risk. Because if these factors aren't present, no claim. So for example, a, a relatively poor performing model that's very opaque might actually be less likely to manifest itself as a lawsuit if it hurts a patient than a better performing model that's easy to understand and explain in court. Finally, plaintiff's attorneys are going to be very interested in the whole circumstances surrounding the injury and the extent to which humans might have been involved in contributing to the harm. That's going to affect who ultimately is going to be sitting at the defendant's table in those lawsuits. And so from a healthcare organization's perspective, the higher risk technologies would be ones where there are humans in the loop and they're taking actions or declining to take actions based on the model output, not just about the failure of the model itself. Um, the highest risk tools would be the homegrown ones. Things are just developed in-house, so there's nobody else to blame when the model goes wrong. <clears throat> so these are all the things that lawyers would layer on to assessments of AI safety when they think about the specific question of where, what's likely to get me sued? What's likely to result in a, a judgment against me? So based on this risk assessment, I think our overarching conclusion is we can't talk about AI liability risk generally. We have to get granular and think about the risks of individual tools because they're not the same for all tools in all contexts. So the number one recommendation we have is to really be thoughtful about each of these factors in this risk assessment framework and ask, should I be adopting this tool based on its potential benefits, counterbalanced against these potential harms specific to this model? And not just adopt, but how can I design my oversight plan? So once I decide to adopt, hopefully the healthcare organization is doing some kind of ongoing monitoring of how well this thing is working. You can't be everything everywhere all at once, right? So we have to find ways to target that monitoring on the highest risk applications. And thinking about risk enhancing aspects of AI tools, I think can help organizations decide, this is where I'm gonna put all my eggs. This is where I'm gonna put most of my eggs in terms of monitoring. These other tools that I've adopted can be monitored with a kind of lower touch plan. Now, a second recommendation we have as lawyers is to take advantage of the fact that Things are good for healthcare organizations right now in the AI market. There's lots and lots of vendors who want to sell them stuff, often in exchange for the patient data that they might be feeding back to the vendor. And that is a great set of conditions for healthcare organizations to bargain for licensing terms, contractual terms that they want. This is a standard way that organizations handle legal risk. And although the tort liability system sets the rules about which injured people can get money, Individual parties in the marketplace are free to do a lot of things with private contracts to say, okay, if a person qualifies for money, who has to pay that? So for example, they can bargain for terms around information sharing. If an organization is gonna do some post-deployment monitoring of the AI, what does the vendor have to ensure that they have in terms of information to do that monitoring well? Of course, the flip side is, if you agree by contract you're doing that monitoring and then you don't do it, that's what lawyers would call a bad fact in the litigation. Um, they can also bargain for indemnification. Some party agrees that they're gonna pay for any damages that the other party ends up owing in this kind of lawsuit. And interestingly, sort of anecdotally, when you look at uh, these kinds of licensing agreements right now, it's the developers who seem to be savvier about this, who are often putting in their own indemnification clause saying that the healthcare organization is gonna be on the hook for these damages. That can be flipped. Another thing Neil and I have begun to notice is that sometimes in their general terms of use, app developers will issue various kinds of disclaimers that might have the effect of shifting liability onto adopters like physicians and healthcare organizations. For example, here's one we were talking about recently from OpenAI for ChatGPT. Take a look at this little sentence that's embedded in a very long term of use agreement. You must not use chat GPT output in making medical decisions. Not don't let it determine your decision. You must not use it. There are vendors right now that are using chat GPT to create all kinds 
of applications that can and are being used in healthcare to inform medical decisions at a minimum. I don't really know what use means in this context. But this kind of thing is not great if you're a hospital. You want to have something in your licensing agreement that helps get around that as it applies to you. And then let's talk about insurance for a second. These agreements can also be used to say who has to have insurance and in what amount. That's critical because it doesn't really help to hold some small company liable for damages if they would just go bankrupt in the event of a lawsuit. Now, when these tools are developed in-house, of course, there's nobody else to shunt liability on to. So it's especially important for healthcare organizations to check their own insurance coverage as they relate to that. It's hard to kind of get under the hood of insurance contracts, but there's a worry that some insurers may be starting to carve out AI-related injuries. And, and like cyber policies don't tend to cover personal injuries. They're there for economic losses. Um, so although we think there will be increasing uh, uh, offerings in the market for like AI-specific insurance, for right now, the talking point is to make sure that, that those kinds of injuries aren't carved out and that coverage is deep enough to, to cover an injury that potentially propagated over lots and lots of patients. Another issue I think that I would direct more to, to legal counsel is to really think about what it's going to take to defend lawsuits around AI. Um, we, we saw in our review, um, Neil saw, evidence that sometimes um, the defendants couldn't sort of reproduce the software output that had led, allegedly led to the injury. And um, in these cases, the litigation tended to be prolonged, where the organization, for example, hadn't documented which software version, how it was used, and so forth. So, uh, you know, in our opinion, this needs to become part of the documentation process for clinical decisions. When you're relying on a model or when you're deciding not to rely on a model, you want to have that in the record, and the organization should have a record somewhere of, of the specifics of the tool that were being used. And, you know, legal counsel are going to have to tech up in this area as well. Another thing Neil noticed a lot is that courts, you know, are still in the process of deciding who are the experts in these cases? Is it doctors? Or do we need to think about forming a lot more relationships with computer scientists to come and serve as expert witnesses in these cases? These are questions that, that hospital lawyers haven't had to confront very much yet. But uh, in order to quarterback one of these defenses, they're going to have to be savvy about these things. And then where I'll end is, I think, on a question that I continue to puzzle over, which is, um, what do you tell patients? You know, when we talk to patients about artificial intelligence, they very much want to know when it's being used in their care. But most physicians that I've talked to said, well, why would I tell them that I, you know, took this output into account in making a decision? It's still my decision. I don't tell them when I use up to date or consult a colleague. Like, I don't really want to hear how the pilot is flying the plane to Buffalo. I just want to get to Buffalo. Um, and patients, I think, have a different perspective. They, they very much want to know. So why does this matter legally? Well, it matters because, um, first of all, when patients find out that something happened in their care that they didn't know about and care about, they get angry. And again, th those are the kinds of conditions that can provoke claims. Um, and it matters because an option that patients have when they're hurt by medical malpractice is to layer on a separate claim for breach of informed consent. And so that's additional damages. And in many states, including our own, the standard of care there is what would a reasonable patient want to have known before making a decision about this kind of care? What would have been material to their decision? If you've got 60% of patients saying, I'm not comfortable with this being used in my care and you didn't disclose it, and it comes to light later, that's not great. So I think there's a medical legal argument for disclosing it, but I haven't fully made up my mind about exactly when it ought to be disclosed, what sort of triggers these concerns. I recognize there are really good arguments on both sides here. And again, we're not in the habit of telling patients every bit of information that goes into a medical decision. Um, but I think there's also an argument that patients can, um, can understand enough about this technology to engage in a conversation about why it's being used. So a reasonable disclosure might be something like, Here's this thing. Here, this is basically how it works. We use it because we understand evidence that it improves care in the following way. And um, we 
uh, exercise you know, oversight by whatever, thinking hard about the model result before we implement it or getting the false positive and false negative rates, uh, rates for this predictive model so we can understand how likely would it be that it's wrong and in what way. Um, and on balance, we think that the benefits of using this outweigh the risk. That might be kind of a reasonable disclosure, but I don't think that's permeated into practice yet. So even though we're in a state of some uncertainty about liability risk here, I think there are a number of steps that healthcare organizations, physicians can and should be taking to try to manage that risk. But I'll close just by saying that as in every other area of patient safety, the best risk management is not to hurt the patient in the first place. So uh, in addition to all of this legal risk management, organizations of course have to be thinking about algorithmic governance, about their general processes for vetting and monitoring use of AI tools. And that, if perfected, will produce the best outcomes for all. Okay, I think we are ready to take some questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michelle. And um, Neil is going to join us for the Q&A part. Um, while everyone prepares their questions, I'm going to abuse my power as a moderator to ask the first one. Um, and you'll hear my bias towards an interest in policy questions, but it does um, align with a question we got online as well. And so you talked about how tort liability is filling the gap that's left by regulators at the moment. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit on what exactly are the regulatory gaps between existing healthcare regulation and those that are needed to account for these new AI tools? And where should policymakers, in your opinion, be focusing their attention on, especially considering you mentioned that risks are very tool dependent? Great. So I know Neil's been thinking about regulatory models, so I'll ask if he has any comments on this in just a second. But I think, um, you know, briefly, other than things that go through FDA approval as devices, we really don't regulate health AI in, in any meaningful way at all. Um, there may be states that require certain kinds of disclosures around it, but that's that's about where things stand. But that's changing. Um, there was an executive order issued by the Biden administration in November that makes clear that um, any agencies that use healthcare AI, which would include the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which administers Medicare, Medicaid, and the CHIP program, are going to have to be much more transparent and exercise much more oversight about what they use, but also um, it has called out certain kinds of algorithms that involve high public health risk, which includes algorithms used in medical care, as things that private organizations are going to have to start making attestations about, saying, here's how we vetted this thing, here's how we're watching it. So um, the government has clearly signaled that more is going to be required. The question is, what form is that going to take? It looks at this stage that for healthcare, it's most likely to take the form of somebody somewhere in the government, perhaps multiple agencies setting standards, performance standards, and then some type of private arrangements for vetting whether tools meet those standards. But I think that's about as far as they've got. And Neil, I don't know what you have to add based on your work. Um, I think one thing to consider, because, um, and it was talked about during the presentation, is how much uh, plaintiffs are at an information deficit. So when we're considering what can policymakers do, a natural question to ask are what are the sorts of activities which can generate more information to, for patients to understand what systems they may be interacting with or if there are defects or bugs, creating information that they can marshal during the litigation process. Great, we'll move on to a question from the audience right in the front here. Hi, thanks very much, Tony Orr from the medical school. Just to follow up that same idea, um, can you kind of discuss the standards that uh, which the, these are going to be rated against? You mentioned that is a standard a human standard or is it a database of images? I mean, how do you, because that's going to be the key. Yeah. yeah. So it's early days, but my understanding is that when the executive order is talking about standards, they're talking about standards relating to the model itself, TBD. <laughs> and and I, I believe to be developed not by the government, but led by people who have a great deal of expertise in the academic sector at Stanford and elsewhere. Um, however, as I sort of hinted at, when courts review these claims, the standard of care for medical malpractice claims is what would 
you know, a reasonable physician in the same specialty have done. And so that might produce an interesting disjunct between what is required from a regulatory perspective and what courts require. But that wouldn't be a new problem. There are all kinds of areas where, you know, FDA has one set of requirements, courts might require more or uh, often require more, may require less, although that's harder. Um, and so it's not always liability protective to just say, look, I adhered to the minimums, minimum, that's how the plaintiff's attorney will characterize. They did the bare minimum that the government in its pitifully lame regulatory effort requires. Um, I'll just move on to a question from the, our online audience, the most popular one, which is, there are certain medical models that have racial or gender bias built in. How do you see liability for these systemic issues being apportioned? Yeah, I wonder what, what you have, what your thoughts are about this. But one sort of problem that I think about is that, because uh, I'm a torch scholar, I'm interested in, in personal injury system, and the personal injury system it's not a like a cognize, it's not a recognizable injury to just say I was discriminated against by an algorithm. That's it's not like having your leg hurt or having severe emotional damage. It's it's not recognizable. Now there are certain laws that create pathways to sue for discrimination, but that's not that's not personal injury litigation. So this is a gap between the expectations that we might have for algorithms and what the tort system can rectify in terms of injuries. Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd add is the sort of arguments you need to make through those other laws from an algorithmic standpoint about what facts you need to show about the way a model behaved, uh, what might be in compliance with the law or out of compliance look entirely different or, or substantially different from the types of questions you might ask from a more towards perspective about reasonableness and, and the type of design. Um, another question in the back? Hi, uh, thank you for the lovely talk. Um, I had a question about, um, so a lot of the cases that you brought up are like very direct to the patient in that like it's a device that it, that's directly being used on a patient or being used to guide clinical decisions. And I'm curious if you think that the same sort of concepts you introduced apply to more like second order cases where, you know, it's kind of like administrative or back office tasks that still carry some medical implications for example, like prior authorizations, if like AI is being used to determine those. Um, a specific example that's like recent that comes to mind is the like United Health, Nava Health um, example, where they use an algorithm to like deny care to Medicare Advantage patients for therapy that ultimately resulted in death. And like, do you think that these same sort of, um, yeah, the same kind of like frameworks apply to those? Yeah, I'll take that one because I'm writing about that case right now. Um, so, so in this matter, uh, United Healthcare, Humana, and probably other insurers as well, um, hired this company called Navi Health to use their algorithm called NH Predict to determine, based on millions of data points from other patients, what a particular Medicare beneficiary will need in terms of care after they leave the hospital, so like rehabilitation hospital or skilled nursing facility care, and um, made it very difficult for care managers to deviate from the algorithm's prediction when making decisions about what their health plan would pay for. So um, this has been of great interest to Congress. And to answer your question, yes, they're suing. So there are now um, two class action lawsuits that have been filed against each of those insurers. Over, It's the same group of plaintiff's attorneys. It's the clone complaints. It's the same lawsuit, essentially, alleging um, a variety of kinds of claims, but not tort claims. So it is harder to connect it to personal injuries, especially because these are older adults who are very sick and it can be hard to prove that their deaths were due to, you know, being in rehab for three days instead of six or whatever. So instead, what the attorneys have done is um, give a laundry list of claims, some for breach of contract saying, I, you know, I signed a contract with my insurance company, they were supposed to give me care, they didn't. Um, but there are some more potent claims around uh, another kind of tort, like an economic tort called um, bad faith um, insurance, which is when you, you, again, you enter into an insurance contract and they um, breach their duty to you to act in your interest in, in resolving claims. Um, and then there are also a, like a little bit of a whiff of fraud claims in these lawsuits as well, allegedly because the plans represented that they were, you know, doing things in the best interest of the beneficiaries, represented also to 
the government that they had certain criteria for determining coverage and then did, did something different. So um, these are brand new claims. It's hard to say how far they will get. Uh, but bad faith failure to settle insurance claims can be a really potent tool of suing because the damages are really, really large. And that's why plaintiffs firms have gotten interested in this area. There are big damages and like potentially thousands or tens of thousands of people who could be in this class. So it'll be very interesting to see where that goes. Another question in the front, in the white. Uh, thank you. Uh, can a HIPAA violation be considered um, personal injury? No. So the question is about the um, HIPAA, our federal health information privacy law. So there are um, avenues to uh, sue hospitals for HIPAA violations, but it, it's not a tort claim in the same way that we're talking about. Now, there are related kinds of tort claims. You can sue for invasions of privacy, and that might be a possibility for someone. But typically, these HIPAA-related claims are actually brought by the Federal Office of Civil Rights on behalf of people who were injured by breaches of confidentiality. They haven't come up in this domain because, um, as you may know, once you strip out certain identifiers from patient data, they are not covered by that information privacy law anymore. And that law was passed in 1996, before we got good at re-identifying people based on a bunch of different data points. And most scholars in the field think that it's wildly outdated in its assumption that like a data set that has tons of information about you, but not these 19 direct identifiers can't possibly be used to re-identify you. The, what I'm imagining prompted your question is that very often when patient data flows out into a third party AI developer, some vestiges of it remain and are used for product development. And as I said, those vestiges won't fall under HIPAA, um, but it is certainly on the radar screen of Congress that that's, that may need to be rectified, that we need, need to modernate, modernize that statute. I'll take another question from our online audience. How, and this one's from Allah Youssef. How would courts differentiate between AI devices that are decision support versus decision-making or altering? Yeah, thanks, Ella. I, I don't know, because as I say, a lot of the, uh, there's loose language in guidance from the Centers for Medicare Services, among other places, um, that just talks about using these tools in decision-making. So as we were talking about before the talk, what, what does that mean? You know, if I uh, incorporate something into my decision, but then I'm also incorporating other pieces of information, is that using, is that relying on it, is it determined by? If I'm Navi Health and I say to my case managers, um, here's this algorithm, try to stay within 1% of the predicted length of stay that this algorithm gives me. And, and if you don't, you probably will be fired. Uh, are they relying on it? Is it determining or are they just using it? So I'm not sure, well, I am sure that as a legal matter, there's not a distinction that has evolved. I'm not sure as a practical matter that there can ever be a meaningful distinction. Um, and any more audience questions here in the front? Hi, I'm curious to hear if you have any thoughts about uh, the applicability of this kind of framework in the context of global health. So um, there's a, or there are a bunch of arguments saying AI could or would uh, improve health in, for instance, low and middle income countries. But on the other side, maybe the risk for patients or organization healthcare provider can be bigger than uh, like there is in high income countries. Mm. So uh, or, do you have any thoughts on, on that? And in the cases that you reviewed, uh, is there any case like where the complaints are coming from uh, this kind of countries? Uh, oh no. Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer to that question, but let me ask Neil, like, can, what can you share about AI governance globally more generally? I don't think I have any concrete instances, but uh, I think one of the things that always comes to mind is you think about AI as being the sort of top layer of the stack, but it sits on top of a lot of infrastructure for collecting data, making sure that data is accurate. And typically models can only perform well when you have confidence in that data infrastructure. And so you see seemingly smaller problems bubble their way up and manifest in mispredictions, the quality of OCR, if you're scanning patient records, handwriting detection, uh, 
uh, problems with low resource languages, if you have to do any type of translational work. So I think those are the types of concerns that emerge as you go into places in the world where you are more concerned about the quality of this data infrastructure uh, and how you get around that is, I think, a very big question. We have a couple of questions online specifically around generative AI. Um, what have you, so the first is, what have you seen in the field in terms of nurses, doctors, and practitioners using generative AI tools and potentially violating HIPAA? Um, and then the second is, um, talks about hallucination risks, um, which is when um, these generative AI tools make up answers. How can we protect ourselves legally without the contractual restrictions OpenAI has? Mm. Neil, you want to take that one? <laughs> sure. So, um, I don't, yeah, I, I, none of the cases we saw had whiffs of generative AI, which is fairly easy to determine. Um, I think something to keep in mind is we're still starting to understand how we work our way through a lot of these errors, like hallucination rates, um, and to what extent we should be thinking about particular deployments of AI in domains like healthcare as a singular model or a model integrated into a larger system, which includes uh, code or subsystems that do a lot of the error catching we've talked about. This is most commonly talked about in the context of hallucination because we always ask, can we detect a hallucination? Can we verify outputs against some sort of database of knowledge that we can go and have manual confidence uh, in terms of its accuracy? We have a, another paper specifically on, on uses and liability risks around Gen AI that we're happy to share. But I think in terms of what we're seeing in, in use, um, you, know, you know, I think it's hard to find a physician, at least around here, that hasn't used it, at least recreationally, to put medical queries in. And um, of course, everyone um, doesn't rely on it. They're just using it alongside other sources of knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, what, what colleagues have told me that I found most persuasive about this activity is that it helps them brainstorm weird stuff they haven't thought about since medical school in terms of differential diagnosis. Um, but Jonathan Chen um, from Beamer gave a very uh, provocative talk yesterday um, on hallucinations around medical inquiries. And uh, the examples were truly chilling in to, you know, right down to the level of completely inventing perfectly formatted PubMed references that, you know, were, were utterly fabricated. So it just sort of reinforces that I think common sense advice that Neil and I gave that should never be the basis for a decision, but uh, one from one of many sources of information that physicians use. Um, I think the other uh, sort of emerging application for Gen AI is to have it linked to patient medical records to help relieve clinicians of some of the burdens of note-taking tasks and th then synthesis of note-taking, potentially produce notes that are patient-facing and help patients become more involved in their care. Um, and that, you know, obviously raises a host of issues around model performance um, that I think we're just beginning to, to explore. But um, again, as with all this stuff, you understand the interest because there is huge upside potential to try to get rid of some of the tasks that are soul-crushing for physicians and don't materially advance the ball on quality of care. A question over there in the front. I'm, I'm, I come from the building AI world, and um, to me, AI is a very hard to understand concept. And um, so I'm wondering, how would we deal with the fact that, you know, a few years ago, if you want to raise money, you say AI, and you get a lot of money. Should I turn that around now and say, now I don't call what I do AI because it saves me a whole lot of legal um, liability issues? Because, you know, um, there's a broad range of algorithms that actually might fall under that. Yeah, what would you, you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to like 60, 70, 80 years in the history of AI and these waves of, of promises and then sort of colloquially, as they're known, AI winters where there's a little bit of a, like you mentioned, a dissociation from the term. Um, I think it's really hard and it, it, it sort of touches on this uh, bigger problem in, in AI governance or AI regulation, which is where do you draw the boundaries for the systems we want the law to touch when we're taking any type of new regulatory action and the systems we want to leave untouched. And I think this emerges in a lot of the, the cases we see where Courts will use terms like computer programs or software, which are exceedingly general. But then in descriptions of the system, you 
it's talking about uh, programs that are doing things similar to AI models. And so one view of it is maybe you define a set of tools that constitute AI, and if it's using those tools, it's AI. But another view is maybe you think about more of the decision-making point or the fact that these programs or computer software, whatever you want to call it, are producing any type of prediction as the sort of threshold criteria. Um, but I, I think it's a really challenging question, and it'll be interesting to see how, how we approach it. Your question is making me think of this really interesting paper that Nigam Shaw and I wrote an editorial about recently. It was published in the Network. And it looked at FDA allocation and marketing materials for companies who were developing software and medical devices. And surprise, surprise, the marketing materials all talked about it being AI powered. And many of the FDA allocations omitted that there was artificial intelligence, certain intelligence in the model. So, uh, you know, there are um, there might be legitimate space for disagreement about what AI is, but I think we could agree that you should pick one and go with it. Yeah. <laughs> your Great. And just wait for the right Thanks. Sorry, just to clarify the takeaway here, it would be to pick an external messaging strategy and go with it independent of the FDA oversight and approval of whatever it is that you're putting forth to them? I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Sorry. Um, so you were just saying that uh, oftentimes external marketing yeah. is independent and actually has nothing to do with what's been provided to the FDA. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just... Yeah taking that away that you were saying, well, just pick one and go with it. And are you saying pick? Yeah, maybe I'm being too flip in my phrasing, but it, if you are characterizing to the to a federal regulator that your product does or does not have a certain technology in it, do not turn around and market it or seek to raise capital based on a different representation of the same fact. Does that answer your question? But actually, my, my question was how do regulators uh, how do they define AI? Yeah, how does the FDA play a role in clearing a product that has AI? Yeah. Uh, because then understanding that, um, I, I, as a, I'm developing a software that helps people take care of themselves when they go into the outdoors. And it's to self-empower themselves by quantifying outdoor health risks and then giving them tools to take care of themselves. The data sets that we are using to inform folks are all best practices from wilderness medicine, which is a new medical specialty. And so in the process, when we put this in front of the FDA and we're saying, look, all of this data is new. You just haven't, or all of this best practices are new. All these peer reviewed journals are new. You haven't seen this before, but we'd like to apply AI on top of this in order to make this usable by our users. Um, that's what I'm trying to understand is how to approach the FDA uh, and what role they play because then once they have an approval, then we can mark, we can understand how to market it, how to take the market, and then what the defenses would yeah. be if something happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, without getting specifics of your case, um, you know, FDA regulates some, not all kinds of software. Uh, so obviously you seem to have a firm grasp on whether it is within their wheelhouse or not. Um, and they have an evolving set of requirements. And that's part of the thing that I think is difficult for developers right now is that this regulatory regime is very much in very much in flux. Um, so I hope you have counsel <laughs> helping you with that. I, I do. It's, just, it, it, it's much more affordable to ask you in no, here than that's it is to talk to them. Um, uh, obviously, you have to, a person has to be very careful to adhere to regulatory requirements. But it is also a wrong turn to do that and then turn around and market in a way that is misleading about right. it. Absolutely. Right. Thanks. I'll move to another question from online, which is, how do you see liability or risk for payers using AI to review and render claims decisions? Yeah, so I think this sort of piggybacks on the earlier discussion about Navi Health. Um, but I'll just sort of add that, they, that insurers have um, long used algorithms for all kinds of tasks aside from what I was talking about before, which is prior authorization decisions. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are some aspects of it that of AI use that introduce new complexity, especially around opacity, because 
one thing that we're very clear with insurers about is when they deny coverage, whether that's deciding, yes, you can get an insurance policy with me, or no, I'm not going to pay for this service, they have to tell you why. They have to give you an individualized assessment, a reason for the decision so that you can challenge it. Because when people challenge these denials, they're very successful. Most people don't realize how high the overturn rates can be. Um, and part of the problem with AI is that, again, we often really can't articulate or even know why a model is recommending yes or no for a particular person or service. You have a question right in the back. Following up on that a little bit, um, I was wondering what your thoughts were about how granular you think um, hospitals and medical providers will need to be in their knowledge about what the AI tool is doing before they use it in some way in making a decision. I was thinking about someone's mentioned something about discrimination earlier. If you are determining a course of action for a pregnant woman of color and you rely on or you or look at an AI tool or any kind of programming tool and then you make a decision, do you need to know whether that algorithm is perceived as biased? Do you need to know about their data sets? And will these AI tools claim trade secret and block them off? So how would you defend yourself then in a lawsuit? Right. So, you know, this area is just governed by a reasonableness standard. And so let me ask Neil, like from your perspective, what does what a reasonable user of these algorithms need to understand? Yeah, I think it's interesting to draw a distinction between the construction of the system, maybe how it was trained, minutiae about the architecture and, and performance of the system, because both can inform downstream users like hospitals or doctors in different ways. Um, the obvious tensions you think about are, do doctors or do these hospitals possess the necessary expertise in AI or machine learning to such that if they're getting a disclosure, they can understand what that means. Um, similarly, when you're getting a disclosure about an evaluation about how well a model or system performs on a group of individuals with XYZ characteristics, evaluation of AI systems can be incredibly expensive in domains where data is hard to collect or it requires as subject matter experts to generate annotations. Or if, if you're dealing with rare diseases, you may simply not have enough patients and so doing that level of evaluation may not be possible. And the question is, how should a hospital look at what its patient pool is and how that aligns with the types of evaluation information they're getting? Um, and so what should individual docs know? So the hospital is like, let's say a hospital has done this vetting and they think it's good enough. But now we have a breast oncologist or a PCP is using the algorithm. What, is, what should she know? I think the uh, an individual doctor would want to know uh, what is the accuracy rate for patients who look most like the one in front of me right now, such that I can calibrate my trust in the system or my willingness to defer or go along with the prediction. Um, but of course, I think the challenge is every single doctor, just like every single AI system user, is, is going to change in their willingness to trust the system and how much this information actually moves them. And how easy is it to get that kind of information from developers? I think the hope is that in a buyer's market, it would be easier to incentivize that information. Um, but I think depending on the grand, as you get more and more granular, it will get more and more expensive and harder and harder to get. I have another question from online. Have you thought about how the severity of AI harm would be determined in a medical context, given that AI systems can create both physical and non-tangible harms? Well, the tort liability system doesn't really care about non-tangible harms. They don't, it doesn't really even care about economic harm at all. Um, it cares very much about physical harms and severe emotional harm. So those, those are the injuries that count. And um, as I've intimated, very often we get into really thorny questions about causation. Um, and this is not unique to AI, it's not unique to software. It's a problem in every medical malpractice claim because when people go to the hospital, they go there because they're sick or hurt. And so their bodies have already taken a beating and bad things happen for a bunch of reasons, including just their underlying disease process. So it's always hard to disentangle causation. Um, and I think AI just layers on a new layer of complexity around figuring out what went wrong. Was it in fact a defect? And what was its causal contribution relative to things that the physician did? 
We have time for one more question. Any in the audience? If not, I'll uh, pick another one from our online endless stream. Um, HHS is increasing transparency on EHR use of AI. What are the implications on litigation risk given transparent AI come with higher litigation risk? Yeah, so the issue here is that it's harder to kind of do things sub rosa when it involves an interaction between a model and the electronic health record. Um, and specifically, it's going to be easier for patients and people who represent patients to understand where AI was kind of operating in the background. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it, just because there's more information out there doesn't always mean that the information helps plaintiffs. Sometimes it can be protective to document these things. Um, but I think it puts another potential defendant on the table when things go wrong in healthcare. Now it raises a question about whether there's a defect in a model, a developer that can also be sued. So again, it's just elevating complexity. It's not necessarily elevating liability, but it's making things harder to adjudicate. Great. I think that is about all the time we have. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much to Michelle and Neil for talking to us about their research. And thank you all for joining us and for asking a lot of amazing questions.